have your Bible today, I'm going to read six verses if you're new to church uh, out of Joshua chapter 4. I'm going to read two verses out of Joshua chapter 5 later. Uh, but, but basically, uh, God kind of put me in a predicament last night. He said, Mark, I want, you to do, uh, I want you to do the three weeks of the last series you've been in for our church called The Promised Land. And I want you to do uh, all three weeks of the teachings you've done in Ocean's Church uh, for all three services. So I've done a different message the last two services. And I'm like, God, I don't want to do that. Um, that's more work. It's easier just to reiterate what I did all day today. But I just really felt impressed that he said, Mark, I want you to share all three messages. And it's cool because I really felt like first service was for first service. And I feel like second service was for second. But I really feel like third service, there's something that God put in my heart that's, again, I didn't share this one yet today, uh, out of Joshua chapter 4. And uh, I ta- I've been talking about um, this, again, it's not just a, it's not a crusty, reheated up microwave message. Uh, this is uh, really what God put on my heart. I read a study, and I'll just give you a little, little emphasis, and I'll kind of tell you where we're going today. But I, I read a survey that was done in 2007 that stated um, only 11% of Christians believe that they're living in their promised land. Like, so if we're doing like a theology according to geography, according to the book of Exodus uh, in Joshua, it would be like this. If, if uh, Egypt... And Pharaoh represented not knowing Jesus and living in bondage and addiction and brokenness, going to hell. That would be, right, that would be Egyptian living. If, if wilderness weeds represented going to heaven but living like hell on earth. Like, like I believe, I'm going to heaven like Jesus. I'm no longer under the tyranny of Pharaoh. I believe in a promised land, but you die in the wilderness. That, that they said, this is crazy, but the study I read said only 11% of Christians said they feel like they're living in a promised land and not the weeds of the wilderness or under Pharaoh's rule still. And it really shook me up because I'm like, man, I wouldn't go to a college that only graduated 11% of their students. I don't even like being a fan of a sports team that only, only wins 11% of the time. I know some teams like that too. But I want you to know, I, I really do believe, there's, you know, it said, they say that about 2.2 billion people believe in Jesus on the earth. About one-third of the earth's population believe that Jesus is, is God. But it's crazy to think that only 11% potentially of that 2.2 billion, 200 million out of 2 billion would be living what they believe would be their call and their purpose, not just a career and a paycheck. And I want you to know that life is more than careers and, and paychecks. I don't think that you're just supposed to suck oxygen to make a living. I think you're you're sucking oxygen to make a difference. And if I could preach before I preach, come on, before I preach, let me say something. Come on. It's three things. I would let you know today that God has you on the earth to know him, to live on mission, and to enjoy both the first two things. And I believe that life is not about one of those three. It's about all three of those things. Because if you live on mission without knowing God, you become religious. And you become very rich in good works, but very poor in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if all you do is know God, but you don't live on mission, you become a Christian navel gazer. And you become a self-absorbed, let's have a six-hour church service that I just get lost in the presence. And you use words like soak, like activate, and all the other hyper-spooky, sensitive, weird words out there in the church about people that all they want to do is sit in prayer meetings for 27 hours a day. Listen to me. I'm all about prayer. I'm all about the presence. I'm all about basking in his presence. But God gives us mountains for valleys. I'll preach that junk again. He gives you mountaintop experiences because there's valleys he wants you to change. And if if life was only about mountains, God would have never brought Moses off Mount Horeb. He would have stayed up there. The truth is, is that God gives us power in mountains to change valleys. And that's why we do conferences, not so that we can live in perpetual conference land. Well, I just want to, I'm going to drive 700 miles to go to this conference and 800 miles because there's gold fillings and there's angel wings. God never promised to chase signs. He said that signs would follow those that believe. Too many Christians that are weird because they're not living on mission. They're living to know God alone. We know him, but knowing him leads us to mission. And mission and knowledge has to be enjoyed. Otherwise, we become the cover girl for the book of Lamentations. Are you with me? So you ready to go today? Have I offended enough people already? 
This guy's rude. <laughs> We're going to have a good time today. If you believe it, say amen. If you have your Bible, again, Joshua chapter 4. First service, let me just summarize here. Uh, the promised land is the land that you're fruitful in. The promised land represents a place of victory. It's not, a, it's not a land void of battles. It's a land that has more victories than losses. Are you with me? In the promised land, God gave them 10,000 square miles of the most pristine real estate on the earth between Africa and Europe. It was the corridor along the Mediterranean Sea with the most fertile soil, rich agricultural place on the earth. Bigger grapes, bigger people. <laughs> bigger giants. But the crazy part is, is we know the story is that God would promise in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham that I'm going to give you the land that you see. And he tells Abraham this, and 600, la 600 years later, after four centuries of slavery, after four decades of wandering, only two out of three million people actually saw the promise from Moses and actually got to cross over the Jordan River, and it was Joshua and it was Caleb. They were the only two people that knew how big the giants were, how big the obstacles were. They are the only two people with the knowledge of how challenging the next season would be. And for literally 400 years, all these three million people did is they looked at God's promised land from the other side of the Jordan River. And we're gonna pick up reading in chapter one of chap or chapter four, verse one, as they cross over the Jordan River, and for the first time in four, actually 600 years, the very first time that God's people would be camping and, and parked out on the other side of the, of the Jordan River. And for the first time in a long time, they're starting to inherit what God wants them to inherit. And here's what I want to say before you tune out today. Let me just say two things about this church and about you personally. This will be the beginning of a season of victory. For this church and for you personally. And if I, can't get a, if I can't get a Pentecostal amen, I will take a Baptist head nod. I'll take a Presbyterian eyebrow raise. You can give me a Latter-day Saint deep breath. Come on, give me something this morning. I believe this is a season of victory. Can I get a good amen? And you mark my words, when victory comes and promised lands come, I think just again to summarize today, you got to know what's preventing you from inheriting the promised land. In first service, I want to encourage you to go back and catch the podcast. I believe the, 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 the disconnect with the promised land is we don't know what the promises are. Our generation has more knowledge than any generation. Today, you can learn more in 30 days than people 60 years ago could learn in a lifetime because of technology. So we, we're rich in information, but we're poor in revelation. And it's crazy because we live in a day and age that most people have no idea. We're like, yeah, you're supposed to do the Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? Uh, thou shall not, a couple things, I don't know the rest. And we can cite that God's law and Bible is good, we just don't know it. So first service, we said the problem with the promised land is no one knows the promises. And they don't know the promiser. So I talked about first service, we, we, we what, what do we, what's the problem? Why, what's, why is only 11% of people entering in? It's because they don't know the word. They've never meditated on the word. They don't talk about the promises. And they don't do what God asked them to do. That was first service. It was really encouraging. Um, and then second service, we talked about not only what's the problem with the promise land. We talked about who the promise land is for. And it's interesting that a book of conquest that had a lot of judgment and a lot of blood and a lot of gore, it was rated R. Come on. That this book of conquest that God would subdue 31 kings and seven nations in seven years, it's crazy that the very first uh, thing that happens after chapter one is chapter two, a story about a prostitute in, in Jericho that would be spared. And it's weird that the only person that's listed in chapter two and the only, and the, and the only, the only person that survived the city of Jericho with her family was a prostitute that believed God. And I talked about, you know who the promised land's for? It's not for perfect people. It's for forgiven people that have been accepted by God that are loved. God didn't send two spies. He sent two missionaries. And so we talked about that last service. You can catch, check out the podcast. And then today, this service, I want to talk to you about not only what the problem is, who's going to the promised land. I want to talk to you this service about how you enter into it. How do you, okay, once you know what the problem is and you start reading the Bible, okay, once you know that everyone's qualified because of God's grace, to go into it, how do you face giants? How do you, how do you confront conflicts? How do you overcome when, man, the, 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 the arrows and javelins are flowing as much as the milk and the honey is flowing? 
You got battles in the promised land. If you got your Bible today, Joshua chapter 4, six verses. I'm going to pray. Uh, after I pray, I'm going to tell a story. If you laugh, we'll, we'll call it a joke. And uh, after that happens, we will, um, we will uh, connect everything that we read to two ideas, and then I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to show up, to speak to some people, to heal some people. Might even pray over some if that's okay. And I'll try to get you out of here in time to watch a little bit of football. Is that all right? God, I just thank you for today. I thank you that you have a promised land of victory. Uh, I, I, again, promised lands are not void of conflict, but there's more winning than there's losing. So I ask you today, for everyone in this third service, that you would meet them where they are. I pray you'd fill them up. I know we're a little bit church hungover from the weekend, but I ask you, Lord, that you do something fresh, new, exhilarating this service. God, we love you so much, and we just thank you that you'd bless the Dallas Cowboys. In Jesus' name, come on, all the Christians said amen. That was a weak amen. Come on, amen. amen. Any parents in the room? Where are my parents at? Parents, come on. Not very proud of being a parent. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Parenting's crazy, man. I, I, I think there's been books written on parenting, but if we're being honest, I don't know if any book ever written has really prepared any human for the task of being a parent. I have uh, uh, two beautiful little girls. Actually, my oldest daughter is here today. Kenzie's here. Kenzie, why don't you stand up and show them how cute you are, girlfriend? She's 11 years old, turning 35. That's when, she, that's when you're allowed to get married, 35. Um, and she came here. It was her first youth conference here at 11. The first ever was conference here at 1132. Isn't that cool? So we got to hang out this week, and she's had an awesome time. But I have two little girls, and... Probably one of my greatest achievements is, is keeping two humans alive for as long as I have. <laughs> Parenting's difficult, man. I, I love my kids so much. I have so many pictures of my kids. I think I have more pictures of my kids than when my parents looked at me. <laughs> I love my kids. I really do. I love them. And uh, I feel like parenting, if you're single in here, maybe you're going to have kids one day, or maybe you're married, you're waiting on some kids. Let me just give you some advice this morning. Uh, I think parenting is a lot about risk management. It's about avoiding the threats of danger. I can pretty much summarize parenting really in a few ways. You're always trying to educate your children on the threats of danger. I feel like every day as a parent, there is imminent threats of danger. Can I get an amen from somebody? There is imminent threats. I feel like every day, it's like, Kenzie, put your coat on. It's, it's negative 10 outside. And when she was little, we lived in Idaho. She's been a California girl her whole life. This girl was trying to like do like slip and slides in December. I'm like, kid, we live in the Northwest. It's, it's cold outside. And I would tell my kids, put your jacket on. They're like, I don't. And what do all little kids say when you ask them to do something? Come on. You'd say it all the time still. No. I don't want to put my, put it on right now, girl. You're going to go out, you're going to get sick, you're going to die. Put it on. You got to warn and educate your kids on the threats of danger. My little Chloe is four years old. She's like a blender missing a lid. And Chloe in a parking lot every day, I mean every day, it's like the same, we're running the same play. She's four. I've been doing this since she was two. It's like we get out of the car, first thing she does when she gets her feet to the ground of the concrete is she tries to bolt for danger. <laughs> Chloe, stop playing. Come here, come here, grab daddy's hand. Grab. You hold my, look at my eyes. Look at my eyes. <laughs> Chloe, there's car cars here. They will smush you like a bug. Okay, Daddy. I gotta educate my kids about the threats of danger. Chloe, brush your teeth. No! Br your teeth are gonna fall out of your skull. You're gonna spend the rest of your life eating out of a straw. Brush your teeth. Okay, Daddy. And then, my God, parents in here can attest this. Go to bed. No! I don't wanna go to bed. Putting your kids to sleep is like a reverse hostage negotiation. It's like, I'll give, you what, I'll give you a Swiss bank account with money and a helicopter on the roof if you stay in your room. Close your eyes. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. If you don't go to sleep, you're going to be so tired tomorrow, you're going to act demon-possessed. Go to bed. 
It's like all day, every day. You're just warning your kids about imminent threats of danger. My God, it was, it was Halloween the other day, and as I was interceding for all the sinners that were trick-or-treating, I, uh, I had to, like, I had my, it's like 9 o'clock at night, and my girls are trying to eat, like, pixie sticks. I'm like, that is, that is Kool-Aid cocaine in a straw. You will not put that in your body. No, you won't. That's dangerous. Dangerous. And then I have, I remember Kenzie tried to wear one of those, like, necklace, necklace uh, candy bar. What, can, or what are they, like, necklace? Candy necklace. There it is. It's a third service. I'm like, do not, you can't wear, I remember she was little, she wore a candy necklace to, like, volleyball practice. I'm like, you can't do that. You're going to sweat? You know the colors of the rainbow on your outfit? It's dangerous. You're going to destroy your clothes. Parenting is about warning your kids about imminent destruction. It's really, again, I'm, I'm, I'm using a little bit of hyperball here. It's hyperbole. <laughs> Slow crowd this service. It's third service. But I want you to know, man, that literally I feel like most of parenting is about reminding your kids about things that can harm them. Every day I take my kids to school, my favorite things to do is take my girls to school other than waking them up and getting them ready and taking them to school but I love the rest of it. <laughs> but when I take them to school, I always try to, I feel like every day I have to remind them they get excited, especially when they're really excited. Like when my kids are really excited, they forget everything. I'll pack a lunch for my Chloe, I got, I got her lunchbox, her backpack, everything. And when she's excited, she's, she loves school, she's in preschool, she's four years old, and she gets out of the car, she's like, as soon as she sees her school, she's like there, she wants to get out, and again, feet hit the concrete, she wants to sprint to her class. Chloe, Chloe, come back, stop playing, come here. Danger. Hey, do not, get, Chloe, come here. Did you remember your backpack? No, Daddy. <laughs> Did you got your lunchbox? No, I, I forgot, I forgot my, get your lunchbox. <laughs> do you got your little water juice jug thing that we didn't have when I was growing up? We had drinking faucets. <laughs> do you got it? Yeah, Daddy, got it. And I have to literally remind, because she's so excited. She wants to see her friend Levi. She wants to hang out with her little friend Chloe. And she has another friend named Chloe. There's two Chloes in her class. And she, she gets so excited. She is so excited that she forgets everything. And I really felt like God gave me a revelation about this crazy. So you have these three million people who've been slaves for four decades, who've been wandering in a desert for four, four, four decades. They've been slaves for four, four centuries. There we go. And these, these, these three million people, they cross over and they're so, can you imagine this? This is the first time in 600 years that they've been on the side of the river that God promised their ancestors. <gasps> Siding! They just watched a river that's a mile ride dry up and they walk through it on dry ground. Man, Grandpa told us that he walked through the Red Sea. We walked through the Jordan River. God stopped the river at flood stage to get all of us through it. And now they cross the river, they're adrenaline surging. Can you imagine, like, warriors? We got this. God's drying up rivers. Our enemies' heads are falling off. Like, we're in good shape. God's hand of mercy is upon us. Can you imagine the adrenaline rush of knowing that, man, God is opening up rivers for us? Man, these, I don't care how tall they are, they are going down, people. God is for us. God is with us. And I bet you literally, like, can you imagine like a dog when it's like getting ready to go on a walk, right? It's so excited. You're like, we're going to go on a walk. It starts freaking out. You open the door. It's freaking out. And you have it on leash. And the moment it steps out of your door, it's like 100 miles an hour. And you're holding it back. This is the picture I have of Genesis, or Joshua chapter 4. Joshua 4, you have 3 million people that are so surged with faith. They got like Mountain Dew faith. They are, that was before energy drinks. They are so excited about what God is doing that they're like, let's just take Jericho, let's take every other. You, you bring all 31 kings, line them up. God's got us. God's given us this land. And it's the craziest thing because literally God tells them what they have to do if they're going to inherit the land. You got to read, you got to know it, you got to talk about it, you got to meditate on it, you got to do it. And then he says, it's for everybody. There's a prostitute in there and if I can save her, I can save anybody. And she's not going to be known as Rahab the prostitute, she's going to be known as Rahab the mother of kings. And the promised land is for everybody. But he goes, hey, before you enter the promised land, here's, here's the secret sauce. You want to know how you're going to enter into this promised land? 
It's not because of how strong you are. It's not because of how hyped you are, how great you are. Here's the secret on how you're going to enter my land. Is the first thing you're going to do if you want to enter my land, the promised land, is you have to, number one, I know you're excited. Chloe, I know you're excited, but listen to me. Number one, Chloe, I'll tell her this whole time. Chloe, remember what I said. And here's what I believe. If you're going to enter the promised land, the first thing you have to do is you have to remember what God has done. This is the craziest thing because they have all of the victories lined up in front of them and they're like on a, a dog on a choker necklace that's literally ready to charge all their enemies and God says, before Jericho, go back to the Jordan. And say it again. Before God gives you Jericho, I need you to actually send 12 men, go back to the middle of the Jordan River. I need you to grab 12 stones from the middle of that Jordan River. Because the day is going to come that your kids are going to ask you, what in the world are these 12 stones all about? What in the world, why do we have 12 stones stacked on top of each other? And what in the world, how, how did we come to live in this beautiful, awesome place? And God says, the key to victory in dangerous places is a good memory. One of your greatest weapons, one of the most powerful things we have access to when we are fighting giants in a new land, one of our best weapons when we face darkness, come on, say with me, is a good memory. Do you know that God gave you a memory for a reason? Do you know that neuroscientists are showing us and telling us from research that when you think about a good memory that happened to you, it releases the same endorphins in your brain when you think about what has happened as though it was currently happening. It's amazing that God wired you in such a way that when you actually rehearse the great things that God has done, that it realigns the faith to, 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 to line you up for what God is doing. It actually gives you the courage to believe for what God is going to do. And I love this passage and this story because it says, before you go into Jericho, hey, slow down. I know you forgot. Hey, come here. I need you to remember something. Remember, grab the stones. I want you to stack 12 stones on top of each other. Because the day's going to come that you're going to forget about how good you have it. Your kids are going to forget, man, how do we live in such a nice neighborhood? How did God give us such a great life? How can we have everything that we've ever wanted? How can we have TVs in every room of our house? The day's going to come that God is going to bless you in such a profuse way that it's going to be easy to forget how you got there. So I want you to grab a stone out of the Jordan. And I want you to stack these 12 stones so that when your kids ask you, what, hey, Dad, what's up? Why do we go to church? Why do we tithe every, why do we serve? Why do we lead a small group? Dad, why do we love God the way that we do? And you actually grab your kid in that moment, you put them on your lap when they're little, or you sit them down when they're older, and you say, Kenzie, Daddy wasn't always a Christian. And there was a day that I was living a dark life in a dark place with, with, with a dark environment. But God, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, did something awesome in Daddy. There are stones that we have to stack. I believe many times we forget about the redeeming that God has done in our life. Psalms 103 says, forget not all God's benefits. Forget that he redeems your life from destruction. Forget not that he actually heals all your diseases, that he forgives all your sins. For, for don't forget that he can renew your youth like the eagles. Do not forget. I think the challenge is when we're facing giants in a new land of promise, that we start forgetting what God has already done. We start dwelling more on the impossibilities of the current giants than the victories of the past victories. I think it's crazy that in these moments God says stack stones because when you face challenges, it's important to remember the times that God came through for you financially. It's important when you're facing a giant of impossibility, remember the prayer that God answered 10 years prior. Remember how God healed you of that condition that the doctor said could never be cured. That you start stacking stones about men. Remember that moment that God actually restored that area of our marriage. Remember how this area was dead Remember how there's no hope in this circumstance? Remember how God touched my mind? There's something about stacking stones. Now, this is where I come from. This, you don't know the neighbor. I, I, grew up in, I grew up in the part of California that if you couldn't afford to live in the ghetto of L.A., the government would give you Section 8 housing to live in the Antelope Valley where I grew up. The only two people that ever made it out of Palmdale, California was Afro Man and Paul George and Mark Francie. Come on. There's the three of us. 
I grew up in a, in a, in a, in a I, I got jumped. The first time I remember getting jumped, I got jumped multiple, multiple times in school. First time I was fourth grade when I got jumped by this little gang. Fourth grade. And I'm not trying to say my story's worse than yours. You're like, dude, you, that ain't nothing. I, I know. Forgive me I'm for insulting you that you had a worse story than I had. I tried. <laughs> but I just want you to know that um, my kids don't know anything about where I come from. So it's important for me to say, hey, Kenzie, come here. This is why we stack stones. This is why we pray. This is why daddy gives. This is why it's a privilege to build the house of God. Stacking stones is a reminder to your future about what God has done in the past. You can write this down. Sometimes to face the future, you have to visit the past. My God. To face the future giants, you got to face past victories. Kind of reminds me of David when he's like, hey, this guy's nine foot nine. King Saul's peeing his pants. No one wants to face this giant. He says that whatever, whatever person wins, the entire rest of the population is going to serve that country. And here it is that there's a little red-headed homeschooler, barefoot with a slingshot, who is a musician. Come on. That's a lethal combination. Homeschooled musician warrior. My God, who knew such a thing happened? And here you got David. And you start playing. He's, you got David. He, uh, he's facing a nine foot nine giant. And rather than dwelling over the impossibility of the giant in front of him, he starts revisiting. Man, I remember that day when I was chilling out, right, relaxing all cool, you know, shooting some b ball, right? <laughs> and I remember how. Uh, that bear came and grabbed my favorite little lamb, Frodo. And when that bear grabbed Frodo, I was like, no, you didn't, bear. You could have grabbed Billy. I would have gave you Billy. Frodo, that's my lamb. So I chased that bear down. I grabbed him, slayed that thing. A couple weeks later, I remember laying out, chilling, relaxing, you know. And there was a lion that came. Now listen to me. The only difference, I want you to just think about this for a second. I would put a lion or a bear any day, if I was in Vegas, I would bet on a lion and a bear any day over Goliath. What David was saying to Saul was, I fought things stronger than this giant. And the only difference is, this requires more confidence because people are going to see it. That's a word for this church. What God has already done in 1132 is actually greater than what he's going to do. What do you mean? I mean that the faith that's been used to get you here is actually all you need to get you to where you're going. But the difference is going to be more people are going to see the victories of 1132 in the days to come. God says he's going to look. If you can slay a bear and a lion, my God, you can take care of a giant. I believe we're going to stack some stones in this church. How do you inherit the promises of God? By stacking stones. Hey, Kenzie, come here. Look at this. Look at this. See this stone right here? This is when I was 16. My first summer camp. Pastor Benny prayed for me the way he prayed for you. I remember that stone at 16. I remember being filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in a heavenly language that no one even told me about when I was 17. I remember when I was 18 years old praying for a collegiate female basketball player who broke her ankle the day before camp and was going to be out the rest of the season. And an 18-year-old that didn't know the scriptures, didn't go to church, never ties, and I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, go pray for her ankle. And in a summer camp, I walk over to her and I'm like, hey, this is weird, but hey, I think God told me to pray for your foot. And with her stretchers underneath her arms, I knelt down in the middle of a worship set at camp. And I said, Lord, I thank you for Molly that you can heal her foot. She started screaming. She goes, ah, it's like heat going into my foot. And she goes, oh, my gosh, it's like the pain. She started crying. She could feel God. She would break off her cast in that service five minutes later, start running around the auditorium. Dustin and I, we got saved by the same man, Pastor, well, really, got, really had a God encounter from the same ministry, Benny Perez. Benny's ministry has been marked by miracles and the prophetic. That's marked both of our churches. That's why we're Ocean's 1132. <laughs> the rest of the band can come up. We're going to go somewhere here. This third service. 
is he stacked stones. To face the future, you got to visit the past. You can't go to Jericho until you've remembered the Jordan. You can't go to Jericho until you've remembered the Jordan. And it's interesting because he didn't just say, hey, I know you're excited, you're forgetting everything, but hey, I need you to remember two things. I need you to, rem I need you to remember what I've done in the past. And the second thing I need you to remember is I need you guys to remember, before we take Jericho, it's coming, chapter, chapter four is coming. But I need you, I need, or chapter five is coming. I, I need you to do something else before we, before we charge the city. I need you to do one more thing for me. I need you guys to remember whose you are. It, you know what's crazy? They could have, they had faith to go take Jericho right away. But God says two things, grab stones and stack them. And number two, before we do anything else, while all your enemies are faint-hearted and they're freaking out, I literally want you, as you're in enemy territory, I want you to reinstitute a practice that's been lost for 40 years. I actually want you to grab your kids, chapter five, you put on the screens, verse one and two. What does it say? Chapter five of Joshua, he says, and it came to pass, maybe. There it is, chapter, no, chapter five, verse one and two. There it is. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until they crossed and crossed over. It says that their hearts melted, that there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Verse 2, here's where it gets crazy. And at that time, in enemy territory, the Lord said, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. There was only two people out of everybody that was circumcised. And I'm not going to go into to details because it makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes you feel uncomfortable. My God, I'm pain talking about it. But it was a practice. And here's, here's the short end of it is that it was literally an outward representation of an, in, an inward covenant. God said back in the Old Testament, he said, Abraham, I want you to circumcise your kids eight days after they're born. It'll be a sign that they're different than everybody else on the earth. There's a favor on you guys. And here's the crazy thing we know, is you do not want to get circumcised pre-Vicodin, pre pre-pain meds, pre-sterile operating rooms. Did you see what it says, flint knives? I'm not going to get into this. This is worst case scenario, people. And the only thing I can think of that's worse than being in a new land full of giants that want to kill you is actually being in a land of giants that want to kill you after you got circumcised. This is worst case scenario. Hey God, can we wait till we kill ever, all of our enemies first? And then we'll like put this thing back into practice? Maybe we'll wait like 3,000 years till we get like technology? Do it with laser? But you know what God says? This is crazy. This is a big challenge of faith. And here's the deal. These three million people, they knew the story about Simeon and Levi, how they went in and actually took out an entire city of Shechem because he, they, they, they schemed them. They said, you want to rape our sister? Here, you can marry our family, but you all got to get circumcised. So three days after all these guys got circumcised, Simeon and Levi, two guys went in and cleaned an entire village of men out. Because when you're actually, when, you, when you're in a, you're in a, um, basically like a uh, convalescent state of healing when you have this operation done to yourself. They are so vulnerable after they would do this act of covenant that the only thing that would protect them would be God. But I love this because God says, before I give you the promise that I need you to remember who you belong to. You're my kids. And more important than your strong muscles and I love this. We're better off if God has our hearts than if God has our weapons and our money. We're better off. God's like, listen to me, guys. I know, I know this is painful. I know this is crazy. This is a bad timing type of moment. It's going to take big faith to actually be vulnerable for, for a week or, or two on in. All your enemies are surrounding you. Here's what I've learned. You can write this down. I've learned that devotion to God prompts divine protection. Devotion to God is what prompts his protection. 
They could have said, hey God, I, look, that's too, we're too vulnerable. If we can't even walk, how are we gonna fight? How are we gonna protect all of our women and children? But God says, look guys, I know Jericho's waiting for you. There's other cities I'm gonna give you. But before you do anything great for me, I need you guys to remember whose you are. You are my kids. You actually, and this is, listen to me, this circumcision, the Bible says that we don't do this anymore under the new covenant. There's now a circumcision of all of our hearts. So whether you're male or female, you know what baptism is? It's circumcision. Literally, that's, we, don't, we, don't, we don't physically circumcise people anymore to be a, be a believer. But here's what we do know is that baptism is what, is what circumcision was in the Old Testament. Water baptism is under the New Testament. It's the idea that God would actually symbolically separate who you used to be from who you're called to be. This is what circumcision was. This is what baptism is. It's saying, look, Jesus died, so we die. Jesus was buried, so we're buried. Jesus rose, so we rise. What he's saying is, is who you were is not who you will be. This is for someone today. You will never enter into your promised land and you let, until you let God make a distinction between who you were and now who he's called you to be. I'm no longer who I was. God says, you are mine. You are mine. He says this, you're gonna make, this is symbolic, but this is the act of declaring a new identity. For 40 years you've been wanderers, for four centuries you've been slaves, but today, you are mine. I will fight for you. Jesus cuts away our old life. He severs the power of sin and death, old temptations, old lust and longings detached from you. No longer are you, are you who you used to be? Your old life has been disempowered. The new life has been empowered. Can I get an amen? amen? I fundamentally believe this with all of my heart. Ephesians 4 says you're a new creation. Galatians 2.20 says it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. It, and the life that I go on living in the flesh, I live by, come on, faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. I, I believe that when you realize this distinction of whose you are, you no, longer, you no longer call yourself what everybody else calls you. You start identifying with what God says about you. I'm God's kid. I'm actually a saint, no longer a sinner in bondage. I'm actually a friend of Jesus. I'm redeemed and I'm forgiven of all my mistakes. I'm complete in Jesus, lacking nothing. I, I know who I am, I know whose I am. I'm free from condemnation. I'm God's co-worker. I'm his workmanship. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm adopted into God's family. I'm born of God, and anything that's born of God overcomes this world. I've been bought at a price. I cannot be separated from his love. And you better believe that I'm more than a conqueror through him who loved me. Philippians says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What are you doing? Sitting by the banks, recovering from circumcision. He said, we had to do two things before God gave us this land. We got to stack stones and we got to make an outward covenant about what God is internally doing inside of us. We are not who we were. And this is for someone in here. You are not who you were. I'll go further. You are not what you've done. Rahab's profession of faith was more important than her profession. She was a prostitute by trade but she was a Christian because of her profession of faith. Are you hearing me today? I don't know who you are today, but I just felt like the Lord wanted me to encourage you this service to let you know that you guys will take, you will take Allen, you will take McKinney, you will take Prosper, you will take Wiley, and you actually will take, you'll take Dallas and Fort Worth eventually. And it will be a sign and a wonder that people will say, because I'm not talking about just big churches, I'm talking about I'm talking about crowds of people that actually encounter God. There's a lot of good church attendance in, 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 in Dallas, but there's not very many people that know their God, that are living strong lives, that are doing great exploits. And that's why God's like, that's 1132. They know me, they're strong, and they're doing some stuff for me. Can I just challenge you today? Is all right? I want to announce to you before it comes that victory is in the air. As you smell rain before it starts raining, victory I can smell for this church. God's gonna give you buildings that you didn't build. He's gonna give you money that you didn't have to raise. And I, there's gonna be people outside of this community that fund the vision of this community. There's innovation in this church that'll be unusual in Dallas. 
I saw it. I, I, I had to work for Cameron and Spencer, and I shared with them last night. But I saw this church literally innovating with high schools, like ministries that would be elective credits that would be in some way subsidized, funded by the, by the public government. I could see like a bridge between Allen High and this church eventually physically being built, but spiritually happening immediately. And you mark my words, this, like this time next year, it'll, I believe next year, September, it'll start. But by this time next year, it'll be fully operational. There will be students walking across the street to do classes and courses here. And there'll be instructors from here that'll be going over there and actually impacting a secular <laughs> separation of church and state. That was never intended to keep Christians out of the public school. That was, in, that was actually, church and state was trying to keep politics out of church, not church out of politics. Do your homework. Stop reading your little weird history books. Read some, read some like church history. Like, read David Barton. Read David Barton. Write it down. He's one of the greatest historians of Christ, like our, the history of America that's probably alive right now. I'm telling you today that God will actually do a work at Allen High School. And I'm talking about religion, guys. I'm talking about people having an encounter with God. Thanks for listening to the Church 1132 broadcast. You can join us live every Sunday during our worship experience or at church1132.com.